I was invited to come speak uh, by the Better Business Bureau to talk about operations within state police. And I want to welcome Colonel Kevin Reeves, who's the uh, 26th Superintendent of the Louisiana State Police. He also serves as Deputy Secretary of Public Safety Services. Thank you so much for having me here uh, today. It's certainly an honor to be here. Uh, thank you for the support of law enforcement and our community that the Better Business Bureau gives us and the businesses that make this up. Uh, I'm in my 28th year with state police and have had the unique honor, and it's truly been an honor, to serve both in South Louisiana and North Louisiana. Uh, as I began this very humbling journey of being the superintendent of the state police, uh, one of my primary goals was to highlight the incredible work of the American police officer and try to make some attempt to change the national narrative regarding our profession. I think we can all agree that the number one priority of a law enforcement agency is public safety. However, our success in that critical mission is clearly dependent and rest upon the shoulders of the employees that make up the public safety agencies. It is a difficult job. It is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week, 365-day job. And those people that make up and wear these uniforms work very hard at it. Uh, their ability to be efficient, effective, and safe in doing their jobs so that they can provide the safety to the public, that's my responsibility. And I certainly never take that for granted. Uh, it's a priority to me to take care of those personnel. Uh, to do that, we must ensure that they have the training, the tools, and the technology that they need to be successful. Unfortunately, in today's society, it seems that public support at times is wavering from what I believe can be only attributed to a small but very vocal segment of society and that wavering has reached new lows. The reality is that law enforcement as a population is one of the most dedicated groups of individuals who are simply compelled to serve their communities and they make a conscious effort every day to risk their lives for their neighbors. Although we cannot discount that there are those within our profession who make mistakes, bad choices, and at times these bad choices and mistakes are critical. And we acknowledge we must hold them accountable. But those situations are rare and they should never cast a cloud over the entire profession of public safety and law enforcement. For me personally, my interest in law enforcement began at a very young age. We had a close friend of our family. Uh, I referred to him as an uncle uh, who was a Baton Rouge police officer. And he used to come by the house in his police car, and I'll tell you all my age, I mean, this was back in the 70s. He would come by the house in his police car in his uniform, and uh, he was truly a hero to me. And uh, he, he, he recognized early on my fascination with law enforcement work and uh, he had me a little shirt made up with Baton Rouge patches on it and I'd get all his old hats and I had me a gun belt and he'd call the house back before we had cell phones and uh, he'd tell my mom, tell Kevin, it's, I'm come pick him up, we gotta go on duty. And so he'd come pick me up in his police car and, uh, and I would be waiting there with my hat on and my little play gun and ready to go and uh, he would, of course, have to sit and have coffee with my parents for a little while. And I thought he actually took too long of a coffee break because I was ready to go. <laughs> but we'd ride around in his car and, uh, and listen to the radio. And at times we'd play on the radio. Um, and it really, really exposed me from a young age to what a law enforcement officer is. And I was captivated with the opportunity to serve the public in the community in which I live in. Uh, the more I was exposed to it, the more I felt a calling to a career in law enforcement. But you know, my desire to serve in law enforcement had nothing to do with pay. It had nothing to do with retirement. It had nothing to do with equipment that were issued. It had simply to do with a calling to serve. I wanted to serve those that made up my community and help others. There are over 750,000 sworn police officers in the United States with 18,000 in Louisiana. 
and I would venture to say that if you peel back the layers, you'd find that most law enforcement officers' stories are similar to mine. There was somebody that made an impression on them and made them want to become a law enforcement officer and serve. You know, these officers, their husbands, their wives, their fathers, and their mothers, their brothers and sisters. Simply, they are our communities. They are what makes up America. And for me, uh, it became a lot more personal here in the last few years. Uh, as a state police commander, I've always been concerned with the well-being of the men and women that serve with me. But now that concern extends to my role as a father. Uh, my oldest son is a new trooper in the last year and works at Troop F in Monroe, Louisiana. And my youngest son, I mean my middle son, is a sheriff's deputy. So, uh, you know, I, I think back all the time, and I've told this several times to several groups, uh, growing up as a police officer and going to work every day and every night was uh, going to do something with my friends because I always felt a family and a kinship with the police officers I served with. And you know the old saying, uh, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And, uh, and I truly feel that way about the profession that I'm honored to serve in now. Obviously, there's good days and there's bad days. Uh, but the good days far outweigh the bad days. Uh, but, you know, I think back, and like I said, I enjoyed what I did. So every night I went to work, I would strap on a bulletproof vest, and I would strap on a, uh, a gun belt here and, uh, and put a weapon in my holster, and I never would think about what my family was thinking. It never crossed my mind. Because for me, I was on the outside. I was on the inside, and they were on the outside looking in. And uh, I never thought about the fear that they must have every night when I went to work. Because when you think about it, their friends, their friends' dads, they don't put on a bulletproof vest to go to work. Why would dad have to put on a bulletproof vest to go to work? Because there's people out there that may want to hurt us that we come into encounter with. Why would dad wear a weapon to work or handcuffs to work? Because there's there's people that we deal with that sometimes, unfortunately, we're called upon that we have to use those tools. Uh, hopefully that never happens to any police officer, but it does from time to time. But you see, when my sons uh, became police officers, uh, when they come to the house, because uh, they still come to the house because their mom still feeds them, <laughs> and uh, so they come to the house regularly to grab a bite to eat, and uh, and but when they come to the house, and I'm, I'm proud of them, my my oldest son is a state police uniform. Uh, I might be a little prejudiced, but he wears it well, and uh, he looks sharp in it. And then my middle son in his sheriff's office uniform, uh, he wears that well, and I'm very proud of him. Uh, and as I look at him with pride, I'm also overcome uh, with a deep fear when they walk out the door to go to work. And, uh, and that fear uh, is something that causes me to spend a lot of time in prayer because I know what they're going to face day in and day out. And the reality is, is I don't mean that in a bad way because 99% of the people that we deal with are very good people. And, uh, and we have law enforcement has very good interactions with them and we get to help them. But there is that percentage of society that wants to hurt police officers or hurt others and police officers have to step in. So knowing that, uh, it certainly takes a toll on me. And, uh, but I'm proud that they're doing what they want to do. Uh, and I think their story is the same as mine. Somebody made an impression on them and made them want to follow that career. Uh, we in law enforcement, we take for granted the toll that it takes on our family. We don't really take it into a lot of consideration. Uh, their sacrifices and the concern that they have for our safety is very real to me uh, because now I'm on the other side of the fence. And, uh, and I get to see it. So we certainly include them in our conversations uh, when we're worrying about our officers. We include their families in that. As a nation, the narrative uh, that should be told in this about when it comes to law enforcement is about the call to serve that law enforcement officers have. They do truly want to go out every day and every night and serve their neighbors. And oftentimes, they're called on to give their lives. Uh, but you know, the discussion should be about the millions of public contacts made by these officers each and every month 
that result in someone being helped, that result in the laws of the land being enforced, or maybe just a personal interaction that someone has with a law enforcement officer that comes out positive. Uh, these are the men and women that I choose to represent, uh, and I think that they must know that they not only have my support, but they have the support of the communities that we serve. A uh, little bit about our department. Um, upon my uh, appointment as superintendent, uh, I asked for a top-to-bottom assessment of our agency uh, to see what have we been doing, what are we doing, and what do we really need to be doing? Uh, what are we doing that we do real well and we need to continue doing well? And what are the things that we're doing as an agency that maybe we could improve upon and provide a better product for the public? So that's all going right now. Um, also, we're looking for the feedback of the troopers. And it's very important not to just to get the feedback to me of the ones that surround me at headquarters. I want to get the feedback of even the newest trooper that has come on to this agency and find out what their opinion is of our agency because they're a part of the family and their opinion is important and their input is important because they are the leaders of this agency, the leaders of tomorrow. We currently have two small cadet classes taking place, uh, which is critical to us. Uh, we're approaching a retirement cliff. I don't know how many of you are aware, but we have 270 state troopers that will become eligible for retirement in the spring of next year. Now that's pretty critical to us. Now uh, I don't think 270 people are going to leave in the spring of next year, but they certainly could and that, that's concerning that they could make that choice. So uh, we were very grateful for the governor's office support and the legislators support uh, in us having these academy classes. Uh, we are working with an aging fleet. Uh, some of our troopers are patrolling in vehicles with over 200,000 miles in them. Um, and that, that's really a lot for somebody at the rate that we run our cars. Uh, they put on a lot of miles. They do a lot of hard work and a lot of hard duty. So uh, we've been able to order some new vehicles this year, and that is certainly helpful to our operations to provide a better product to the public. Um, we need to increase our pay for our dispatchers. Uh, because uh, we're having trouble hiring, and even when we hire, we're having trouble retaining uh, our employees as dispatchers because they have better opportunities elsewhere for better pay and better benefits. And you have to understand that these dispatchers are the lifeline for police officers. Sometimes these dispatchers are the only voice that a law enforcement officer hears in a critical situation. And they're on the backside arranging for people to get to an officer when they're in a critical situation. But uh, they serve a very, very important function and they take those functions very seriously because they know that's the voice that's being heard. Um, we are working to secure funding for a computer-aided dispatch, what we call a CAD system, and that'll improve our officer safety by allowing us uh, better opportunities to keep up with our officers and to know where they're at and to be able to get help to them and also to be able to provide a better service to the public by uh, being more proficient and more efficient in dispatching our officers that are closest to whatever's going on that we can get there quickly. Uh, and we're trying to do all this in a very challenging budget climate, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, but we have been fortunate, the governor's office and the, le the legislature has worked very well with us and we certainly want to thank them for that. Um, while we do have needs, I firmly believe that, uh, that we are still one of the best trained, best prepared, prepared, and most professional law enforcement agencies in this state, if not the country. Uh, and we do have very, very good partnerships, unprecedented partnerships across the state with other law enforcement agencies uh, that operate at the same level that we do. Uh, and this relationship extends from senior staffs all the way down to the troopers, the deputies, and officers that actually work the road. Uh, so I'm very proud of that. Um, we have amazing, amazing intelligence capabilities with our fusion center, uh, which is continuously evaluating threats that are posed to our state. Uh, and we share that critical information all the time with the decision makers. Uh, our fusion center, inside of our fusion center, uh, we have eight agents and analysts from 
the federal level, the state level, the parish level, and the local level that are constantly evaluating what's going on in our state and what poses the greatest threats to our state so that we can be responsive to it or we can be preemptive of it. Um, I'm very proud of the staff at our crime lab. Uh, they work tirelessly to support investigative needs across the state in the hope of bringing some level of closure to the victims of crimes. Uh, a lot of people don't know, I know you've seen um, news, recent news where the crime lab was uh, very important, played an important role in catching uh, criminals, but a lot of times these, these analysts uh, from the crime lab uh, and these forensic pathologists, they come in and work 24 hours straight because they care that much about evaluating the evidence and bringing closure for the families and stopping the crimes before any more damage can be done. Um, I'm proud of the Louisiana State Police's history and our tradition of public service. I'm proud of the support that you give us and the support that the community gives us. Uh, I look forward to the future and I look forward to continued support. Uh, and I certainly would like to thank you for having me here today because it's truly an honor to be here. My public safety tips are this. Uh, from a state police perspective, I would like for everyone to wear their seatbelt. Uh, I'd like for them to make conscious decisions not to drink and drive. And also of just as equal importance is distracted driving is becoming a huge problem for us. So I ask everyone, please put your cell phones down as you're riding down the road in the car and let's pay attention to where we're going. Uh, well, I think the state, the state looks uh, safe right now, but you know, we're always being, uh, we're always diligent to be looking for those threats and monitoring what's going on inside our state as well as what's going on outside of the state that could affect our state. I think leadership is a, of utmost importance. I think that, uh, that those that are out doing the job, uh, they need someone there that's making decisions and making the right decisions. We're a community here in Louisiana, and, uh, and whether you're in the business community or you're in the law enforcement community or any of public safety communities, uh, we have to work together and we, we have to work together to make sure that our streets are safe.